Okay, let's, um, let's pray over the word. Lord, thank you for this word. I thank you, Father, Father, that it'll find a home in each and every heart. I thank you, Lord God, that um, the eyes of their understanding are opened and, and they are enlightened, Father God, by the Spirit and by the word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. And, and tonight we're gonna talk about living a Christ-centered life. You know how many know it's important to be Christ-centered? If you're not Christ-centered, you're probably self-centered. And if you're self-centered, trying to live this life, you're gonna, you're gonna struggle. You know, one of the, I mean, God's beautiful all the way around, but one of the things, one of the things that I've really noticed about God is, because he's done it for me, he'll meet us all right where we're at. Anybody, when you call out, when they call out to him, he'll meet them right where they're at. But then when he meets them and, he, and they go on this journey, he won't let you cut corners. He won't let you compromise. You know, we must live our lives by the word of God. We must not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And, and in our journey that God takes us on, he brings us uh, into the church or to the fellowship of believers. And, and I say it this way, he boxes us in which I like, puts us right in here and tells us, hey, that person sitting beside you is just as loved by me as you are. Amen? That person sitting beside you, guess what? The same spirit that's in you is the same spirit that's in them. And you can't say that you don't have need of them. Because the natural way of people is to say, I don't need you. Well, that's not God's way. And so if we're going to grow spiritually, we have to do what God says. And coming to church and being a, a vital part of, of the church, is, is, is this, that's what this message is about tonight, is, is um, just uh, doing what God said to do. And as we do, we'll see that God will do his part in our life. But this scripture here in Galatians 2.20, the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I, now, which I now live in the flesh, now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That should be a staple scripture in everyone's life, right? I noticed uh, when we were singing uh, these songs tonight, um, some of the songs that, that I'm not a particular f uh, fan favorite of uh, songs that are about I or me, but I know some songs have them in there. I'm not, not, not saying don't sing them, but I noticed that Sonona was changing it to we and us when she was singing. I think that that's appropriate. I don't think that we should be too much I or me when we're together. I think it should be it's our God, Amen. not just my God. He's our God. God loves us. I believe as, as, as the church would um, get used to that and, and, and get that mindset in there, we'll become even more of a, of a team, more of a, of a source of unity that God and his precious Holy Spirit can work through. And so um, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14, 12. I believe the scriptures tonight are King James or New King James. And so, um, you know, the Bible says that we're going to read this. It's a, it talks about excel at edifying. Excel at it. Some people excel at division. Uh-oh. Some people excel at gossip. They're real good at it. But we are to excel at building our brothers and sisters up and lifting them up. You know, strong people don't put other people down, do they? They lift them up. That's what, that's what strong, spiritually strong people will be, all be about, the lifting of others. Uh, um, some, some years ago, it, saw, it came across on the Rama um, alumni. I got an email about uh, a minister that passed away. He wasn't even, that, wasn't even that old. He was a youth minister and I think a worship leader. And I just started reading about, I went to the, actually went to the church site and started reading about this minister that passed away. I don't know why, I just had a, had a I just thought I'd go and read about him. And, and um, what I had read about him touched me. 
Because the people in that church, they had a common theme when they talked about their pastor that, 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 that went home to be with the Lord. And I could sum it up in this. They were saying that he was a lifter of people. He was a lifter. We all should be lifters. Amen. We should all know that that's exactly what God wants from us. If it's not I that lives, but Christ that lives in me, then I'm going to lift. Because if, if not for the grace of God, there go I. And so, but you know, when you do it God's way, you get uh, prosperous. When you do it God's way, the fruit of the Spirit will come alive in you. The love and the joy and the peace and all these wonderful things that God promises. But initially, God's way seems unappealing to the flesh. Or am I the only, only one that happens to? I mean, he talks about serving, sacrifice, submission. I mean, the flesh typically hears those words and they're like, oh, I don't want none of that. You know what those words are? They're holy words. They're precious words. They're words that will get you deep into the presence of God and get you right smack in the middle of the will of God. Amen? Amen. Everything we do, we do for God ultimately. Everything we do. I don't like it so much that sometimes uh, pastors have a little issue that they, they'll loosen people out of their church. And I see this a lot. You know, as, as, I, as I read on Facebook and things. <laughs> and uh, they'll say, after all I've done for them, they, and they're going to do this. Well, hey, you are to be doing it for God. Amen? Not them. They just got the benefit of it. And so um, even pastors have to be careful. I'm up here for God. I'm up here because I believe with all of my heart for some reason, God said, I want you to be up here and I'll anoint you as a pastor. If it weren't for that, I don't know what I'd be doing. Might be still climbing trees or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know, but when God tells you to do something, it's sort of hard to shake it. And you know what? I don't want to shake it off either. And in my journey, God has challenged me and, and, uh, he hasn't put me through any kind of accidents. That's not how he challenges you. He hasn't tested me with any kind of bad things. But yet, he will require you to be in certain situations that will cause spiritual growth. For me personally, it was being an usher. I didn't want to be an usher. And it was hard on my flesh. Because when I went to Ramah, I still had a mindset in my flesh that, okay, I'm going to be here. I'm going to do good. I'm going to get all straight A's. I got all A's but one B. That's a whole other story. I'll tell you about that some other But, you know, but that wasn't good enough for God. And I remember one of the first service, church services I was there, Mom was there with me, and I, and I don't know if Mom remembers, but I said, Mom, see those ushers? I don't have the need to be one of them. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't much longer. The Lord said, hey, I want you to be an usher. I'm like, I, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. <laughs> And uh, he spoke that into me just as loud and clear as when he told me to go to Ramah. And, uh, but I put him off for a couple of weeks, and then I felt bad about it. And, and my own heart convicted me because I, 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 th I thought, you know what, Lord? I'm 35 years of age. I'm a single parent with four children. And you love me enough to get me on this journey and allow me to go, in my opinion, the greatest Bible school in the world. And I, I'm not going to bail out on you. That was a learning experience, that was a growing experience, that was a stretching experience. But ultimately, I did it for God. I believe that God wanted me to step out because he was going to use me and empower me to help people, to touch lives. That's what we're here for, right? To change lives. And so, and while we're at it, I'll say this, that, you know, the Bible does say that we're to lift people up and encourage people. And, and I'll just, you know, one of the things I tell the leadership of the church and when people first start preaching and ministering is that if someone gives you a compliment and they say, hey, good message or, or great song, do not, someone say do not, do not say it's not me, it's God. Don't say that because that makes me irritated. <laughs> Why? 
Because you're deflating. When you deflect the compliment, you deflate the person that's lifting you up. To tell you the truth, they know it's God. A good answer would be, thank you for seeing God in me. Thank you for believing in, in what God's called me to do. Right? And then you can give God all the props. Because we know you don't want to take God's glory. But don't deflect them. Let them build you up. Some people don't like to get compliments. Well, you're, you're going against the word of God. This church should be a house of compliments and encouragement because that's what the Word of God says to do. Like, I'd like to give a compliment to the, to the crew that just sang there. That was beautiful. Very beautiful, right? It, it ministered to me. And so, it was Christ in you coming through those songs. And so, look at 1 Corinthians um, 14, 12. It says, Paul says, even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek ye that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. And of course, in this case, he, he goes on to explain, if you're going to give a, uh, operate in, in one of the nine gifts of the spirit, which is tongues, supernatural gifts of the spirit, seek to edify the church and, and interpret the tongues. But this goes the whole gamut, Right. This, is, this, this isn't just in that scenario. We are to seek to edify the church. Not only edify it, but excel at it. What's it take to excel at something? You know what it takes? Unless you're like a natural or something. A one, two, that's a good start. And a whole lot of practice. Like right now, I am one terrible golfer. Because I don't golf much <laughs> anymore right and, and uh but back in the day when leslie and i had the golf fever we would go out two or three times a week it was lightning we didn't care we we're the only one out on the course <laughs> holding the lightning rod in our hand <laughs> and i was way better then than i am now so how do you get how do you excel at edifying you practice it you do it how can you edify someone? With a smile? With a handshake? If, if it's someone that you know and you know that they don't mind? With a hug? With a good word of encouragement? Amen? With, with just a simple, uh, hey, brother or sister, I, I, I've been praying for you. That's how you do it. But it says, once again, it says, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Sounds like the church is pretty important. Can, you can't excel at edifying the church if you don't go to church. Now, you're in church, so I understand that. Right? If I got a bag of Fritos and, and Diet Mountain Dew, and I'm watching Joe Olstein, T.D. Jakes, uh, Creflo Dollar, I got the whole power line up. They're all great preachers, by the way. Nothing against them. Amen. But I didn't go to church. I heard some good preaching. To go to church, you actually got to get, get dressed and get in your car. Well, me, I can walk over, but drive, right? Get out of the car, shut the door, and go in. Now you went to church. And then once you're in there, excel at edifying. So many times people say, well, I don't know what to do in the church, and I don't feel like I belong, or I don't feel like God has anything for me. I'm telling you, the most important thing that you can do is excel, seek above everything else that you can lift everybody else up. Yes. Amen? Sister Lori does an excellent job with that. I mean, she's very energetic, Sister Lori Gauntz. And she said to me the other day, she said, do you want me to tone it down? I said, no, I don't want you to tone it down. I want you to keep going up. Yes. Because that's contagious. Amen. That makes that makes me feel good when I come in and see someone that energized and genuinely excited to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. We don't want we don't want to be the church of the frowny faces. <laughs> right. But let me say this. I'm not saying like sometimes people are to come when you're hurting and you're having a hard time. Come. Amen. And may we lift you up. 
And may we help you. But, you know, somewhere along the line, you've got to turn that frown upside down, though, eventually. Right? What Bud Messner say? Let your smile be your umbrella? That's what, we, that's what we're supposed to do. People really, really look at the countenances of people. I try to, ve- I try to be very careful that, because I come out of a more reserved nature. Now, I love people, I do. I don't have nothing against people, but I just wasn't very social and, and before I became a pastor. And I'm still working on it. But I, I'm very conscious of the fact that I better, I'm going to keep my head up. I'm going to keep looking around. If, if I make eye contact with somebody, they're getting a big smile, right? Because they came, and I'm happy that they're here. And so that's, I'm just being a little transparent here. You know, if you start smiling a lot, it'll, it'll, it'll become, it'll be like, it'll start to affect you inside. You know, if one person starts laughing, then another person will start laughing, and then another person will start laughing. But the Passion Bible says it this way. You were so passionate about embracing the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So they're passionate about that. They want these spiritual gifts. But he says, now become even more passionate about the things that strengthen the entire church. Did you get that? Be even more passionate about the things that strengthen the entire church. We want to see everybody rise up. Everybody rises up together. And then when you succeed and you do well, we all do well. Because we've prayed for you to do well. One translation says we are to excel, super abound, be in excess at building up or edifying others. Be committed to meeting others' needs. Pretty, it's pretty strong wording, isn't it? So look at uh, 1 Corinthians um, 13. We're going to definitely cover some scriptures here tonight. So 1 Corinthians 13. So let me just say, Paul's talking to the church at Corinth, and they came out of a really, really worldly background. I mean, they just were really worldly. And in fact, Paul, you, you know, when he came back to the church, he said, look, you guys, you're all carnal. Then he, then he said they were carnal. He said, you're carnal Christians. He said, you should be getting the meat of the word, but I got to feed you the, the, the milk of the word. You know, there's, there's a difference between a carnal Christian. A carnal Christian is someone that's more naturally minded and, and thinking and, and uh, concentrate on the earthly things, the, the natural things. Uh, uh, instead of, as opposed to being spiritually minded, having the mind of Christ, you're, you're not so carnal minded. A carnal minded person will, will um, tell you off if you get on their nerves. They'll gossip about you. They'll do all kinds of terrible things. Now a baby Christian has a similar type mind, but, they, but they're in a little better shape because they're just starting out. They're just learning. But sometimes a carnal Christian can be someone that's been a Christian for 30 years. And they haven't, they, and maybe they did run well, as Paul said, but something hindered them. And so you are in charge of your own mind. Paul didn't say renew each other's mind and, and, and transform each other's mind. He says, you do it. You renew your mind. You transform your mind. And one of these messages like this tonight, a message like this, well, well is a good reminder of the, the, what we're to, the kind of spirit we're to have. But, you know, in, uh, so 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about the powerful gifts of the spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, he's talking about the gifts of the, in, the, in the church. But right in the middle of 12 and 14, he, he talks about love. Do you think he did that intentionally by the leading of the Holy Spirit? Definitely. Because you are not working any gifts without the love of God. Amen. You're just not. In the beginning, people can, but they, they are required to grow and, and, and guard their own heart. And uh, it, it's awful tough. I'm talking about in the church setting to get, because it, it depends on atmosphere. We have to have a good atmosphere. 
of love and commitment and edifying, and then it'll be conducive for the Holy Spirit to move through us, in and out of us. And, and so, but then look at what he says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. He, sa- he says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And so, verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing, or it profits me nothing, what? Spiritually, you're going nowhere. You can have the faith, but faith without works is dead. And faith works by love. So if faith is a, is a shiny new Cadillac, the love is the gas that makes it go. You don't have gas to put in that new Cadillac. You're going to be sitting in the driveway waving to everybody going by. Yeah, they might be driving a Pinto, but at least they're going down the road and you're not. You might have to get them to pick up some milk for you or something because you don't have no gas. You're not going anywhere. Faith works by love. That's what I'm saying. See how God boxes us in? He's not going to let you cut corners. He'll meet you where you're at, but then we are required to grow thereby. Doesn't, doesn't it say in Timothy, you purge yourself. You determine what manner of vessel you are. Not talking about God's love. It's talking about your usefulness for the kingdom of God. You determine. You can be a vessel of gold and silver and vessel of honor, or you can be a vessel of wood and clay or, 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 like, or just something that's not really um, useful. Who determines that? We do. We do. You know, some of those, at the turn of the centuries, a lot of those great miracle crusades that they had, these ministers would go all over the cities of the United States and do these great miracle um, events. Do you know, you know what made that happen? They all had teams of prayer warriors that would go a week, sometimes two weeks before they even got there. And they would rent a hotel room or in a hotel lobby, and they would pray, pray all day long, all week long until the minister got there. And when he got there, he just walked in through the open doors of the prayer warriors. Where are, where are all the prayer warriors? We need prayer warriors, don't we? And so look at verse 3. He says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. And so we can see love is pretty important. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 11. And so this is when he's explaining these, these supernatural gifts of the Spirit, and he, uh, um, he makes a statement here. He says, but the one... And the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. And so the Holy Spirit works these gifts in the church as He wills. I heard Andrew Womack say one time that the Holy Spirit is always willing. You know what? I agree with him. You know what holds him back? Not a lack of faith. People believe that stuff. They believe this. Not a lack of faith. Not a lack of fervent desire for the gifts. Lack of love. Amen? Lack of unity. Lack of harmony. Do you think someone could want to operate in a spiritual gift and and do it out of a selfish, self-centered motive? They can't work them that way, but do you think that there can be people that want to and try to? Every day, all day. (laughs) Every day, all day. Why? Are they bad people? No. They're children of God just like us, but they have to learn. They have to learn, not I, but Christ that lives in me. They have to learn to to walk in love. You know what's missing in a lot of churches? We have have it in place in here. It's honor. Honor. Honor has reward. 
God tells us to honor each other. I'm to honor you 100%, which I do. I, I promise you, I've never stood up here and not understood and realized that you are children of God brought by the blood of Jesus Christ just like me. I've not once stood up here and, and have, have ever thought that I'm better than you in any way, or God loves me more than you, or God has more plans for my life than you. No way, no how. But the honor comes this way too. Amen. Right? You can only receive from who you honor. Amen. But honor has reward. And so uh, I wrote this in my notes. I believe that the Spirit is always willing, but it, the Spirit of God is hindered by the lack of love. Not faith, not lack of passion for spiritual gifts. God's love forgives. God's love gives. And his love lifts up others. God's love comes from a Christ-centeredness and not a, a self-centeredness. That's why serving in a church is a good thing. It's a good thing. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And he said, I'm giving you an example, guys. He said, if I wash your feet, you ought to wash the feet of one another. In other words, he's saying the way up in the kingdom of God is down through serving. That's what I'm saying. The flesh hears these words serving and giving and sacrifice and submission and honor and, and obey. There's a good word. Sometimes when Leslie and I are giving these marriage counselings and people don't know the word very much, and I, and I, use, I have to be very careful how I use some of these words. Because they don't, the, 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 the women don't understand it. But I'm not holding it against them because they might have come out of a really bad situation. And they, and they deserve an explanation. And so I'll use words like respect, you know, and, and appreciation. And then I'll work into the, the, the power words. <laughs> but you have to explain to them before you actually bring the word. Because if you just say submit, they'll be like, I ain't submitting to nobody. He's going to submit to me. Never mind, not all of them. Some of them. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know who the, the most submissive person that ever walked the face of the planet was? Jesus. He was so submissive. He said, not my will, but your will be done. He was so, so submissive to the Father. He said, the words that I speak are the Father's words. And the works that I do are the Father's works. He's our example. When we do these things, man, we shine bright with the glory of God. And the peace and the joy and the fulfillment and, and the getting into God's will just just comes alive in us. That's what I'm saying. You can't cut corners if you want to grow spiritually. I'm not talking about your salvation. Congratulations, you got the gift of salvation. That's, that's a good gift, trust me. When I was talking to that woman, um, I was telling you about it at the, at the hospital, I threw my old line out at her. I was talking fast too because I knew I only had a little bit of time for the nurse would come. And... Uh, I said, well, you're not going anywhere now because I believe in a God of miracles. I said, but when your time is up, somewhere down the line, why would God let you into heaven? I'm telling you, 99 times out of 100, you're going to hear what I, just, what I heard. I'm, I'm serious. She said, well, I, I hope I'm in because I'm, I'm a good person. And I said, well, you're talking about the fruit. I want to talk to you about the root. I want to talk to you about the born-again experience. That's a gift by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what? She wept and wept when she received the Lord. Did that happen because I'm a pastor and I went to Ramah? It happened because I had a heart, I had a desire to see this woman come in. I got a phone call, and 15 minutes later, I said, she was telling me about her sister up there. I didn't even know her. And I said, well, you better make sure she wants me up there. And she's like, oh, well, she'll, she'll want you up there. And uh, the spiritual 
what they, what they call him at the hospital now, the spiritual leader or somebody was up there. What's that? It wasn't a chaplain, but I mean, it was, it was someone, spiritual advisor. I said, oh, I better get up there. And uh, I was out the door. I was there within 15 minutes, walked right in there like it wasn't nobody's business. That's not, that's God in every one of us. Why can't we be the biggest soul winning church in the community? We can be if we have the will to do it. What's it going to take to do it? Just go out and do it. The more you do it, the more it'll, it'll, it'll come alive in you. Amen. You say, well, what if, uh, what if they smack me in the face? Well, try to duck quicker. <laughs> Chances of that happening is not going to be very, it's, it's a very, very big. But what if they say yes? What if you're the last person they ever see on the earth before they, they go into their eternal destination? Amen. This world is spiritually dry. They're spiritually starved. They're like what Jeremiah said. They're, they're like these little shrubs, these little stunted trees in the desert. They're not getting any kind of spiritual truth. We are the trees planted by the water. We are feeding from the well and the, and the, and the life-giving flow of the Holy Spirit within us. We are flourishing in this dry and thirsty land. They need a drink. We need to give them a drink. Why, when are we going to start seeing the desper, desperation here? I'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you. It's desperation time. We, we need to get out there. If someone sees someone physically in a, in a need, or say like, you know how like they're in a car wreck and somebody will go over, a bunch of guys will flip a car over and try to save someone's life or they'll jump in a river and risk their lives. Well, I ain't asking you to flip a car over or jump in a river. I'm just saying go out and talk to people. Amen. And you can, you, you can use my method. I don't got a patent on it because I got it from someone else. Ask them, why would God let you into heaven? And they're going to walk right into it. And you're going to say, ah, talking about the fruit. Let me tell you about the root. Come on now. Amen. Salvation is a gift of God, not by works. Least anyone should boast. No braggers in heaven. And you can say, oh, well, now you don't want to earn your way to heaven like that because there's, you'll be the only bragger in heaven. Because no one else got, you know, it's a gift. I've said this before, but I know uh, one time Pastor Dick went to talk to someone at the nursing home, he, and someone had a, a stroke. It's an older fellow, maybe in his late 40s, and his parents were in there, his elderly parents were in there. And um, Pastor Dick came back to the church, and he said, I got three of them. I got them all three. And he lived on that spiritual high for at least two, three weeks. You can see it in his face. There ain't no joy like the joy of leading someone to Christ. Amen. Why? I think a lot of churches get too technical. We need this and we need that and we have to do this and we need this, this revelation and we need that. No, what you need is to go ahead and get on out there and tell someone about Jesus. That's what you need to do. Then bring them in here. Bring them in, build them up, make them wise. Then you'll have some more Sononas running around, right? Oh, homegrown, Brother Joe. That's what we need, right? All the other stuff will have, it has its place, but nothing has a place like bringing people in. Look at um, Hebrews 10, 24. And so let's say someone's going along and they're growing spiritually. And then all of a sudden they, they're, they're running well and then something hinders them and they, they, they pull out of the spiritual things. Anybody ever know someone that, that, pull, that pulled out of spiritual things? And say so they pull out 
and um, let's say they, they, they met some kind of a mountain of the flesh or some kind of a mountain of the emotions or some kind of whatever, and they just stopped. And then say, say five years later, they, they come to their senses. They, ca- they recover themselves out of the snare of the enemy. And they're like, okay, I want to get back to serving the Lord. Guess where they got to go? Straight where they stopped. You don't go around the mountains. You, know, you, you go through them or you move them. Whatever tripped them up before, they're going to have to, and I'll use this word because Keith Moore used it, and, but, but you know how we, talk, how we think about testing. Pass the test, enter into the rest. Amen? You, their life will give you testings just by virtue of you following God and, and growing spiritually. And so you, you keep passing those tests and you'll keep entering into the rest. There's no other way but to go, to go forward. Look at Hebrews 10, 24. It says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. The Passion Bible says, this is not the time to pull away and to neglect meeting together. As some have formed the habit of doing. You know, it can be a habit. In fact, we should come together. So any kind of reason or explanation that someone has that, that, I'm not talking about, you know, just missing here and there because life gets in the way sometimes, but I'm talking about literally just, they don't go anymore. There's no explanation that, that, that verifies what the word says. It goes against the word, right? I say it this way. Sometimes when, when we fall down in our walk, we're all, gonna, we're all gonna fall down or stumble or something. I'm not talking about getting into crazy stuff, but, but what, if, what if you get angry and you act like you knew you shouldn't have acted? That, you stumble, right? Because the anger of, of, of a man or woman of God does not promote the righteousness of God. But you get it right. So there's a difference between falling down and getting back up than sliding way back. Sliding back in, you know where the devil wants to take you? Whatever you came out of, wants to take you back to the old familiar stomping grounds of the flesh. Well, come on now. You know there's nothing back there. I know there's nothing back there for me. Just the thought of that ought to scare some people straight. So I ain't going back there. That's why the Bible says put your hands on the plow and don't look back. And the New, the New Living Translation says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. This, actually, it says, like, think of ways. Be creative. How can I think of a way to motivate my brothers and sisters to, to acts of love and good works? Ask the Holy Spirit. He'll give you good, good ways to do it. But it's to be our mindset. It's how you grow spiritually. But wouldn't the churches literally be heaven on earth, literally, an atmosphere if everybody just did what God said? It would be. Now look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. Philippians 2, 19. I've said, you know, um, I'm thankful for this last year or a year and a half. I mean, um, in my ministry, I've grown tremendously. I, I have really grown. I've really, um, I, I'm always looking to grow, but, uh, but I've had exponential growth, I, I really believe. And um, so we'll, we'll keep growing spiritually until Jesus comes back. Then there won't be no need to grow spiritually. Philippians 2, 19 says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus, this is Paul, 
to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. So Paul is in prison at Rome. And he's, look, he's saying, look, I want to send Timothy because I, I care about you. I want to find out what's going on, and I can't get there. But verse 20 is a kicker of a verse. He says, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Paul said he, he had hundreds and thousands of people. He had no one but Timothy that was like-minded. What, what were they all seeking if they weren't seeking the, the benefit of the other people? He says it. What did he say? Verse 21, they all seek their own. These are people in the ministry. Paul had a big ministry. He had a lot of churches going. They're all seeking their own. They don't naturally care for your state, but Timothy does. And I'm sending him. I want to be with the Paul and Timothy crew. Amen? And then in verse 22, he says, But you know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he has served me in the gospel. He is faithfully, Timothy faithfully served Paul in the gospel. Now, I think about the disciples. Did they grow spiritually? You know, James and John, the sons of thunder. Those boys had a lot of growing to do. They're the ones that requested that they would have special privileges when they got to heaven. Not only did they request it, their mother requested it. And it shows you what, the, what that division does because the other disciples were not happy. These guys didn't have a clue. And they're literally walking with the greatest teacher that ever walked the face of the planet. They didn't have the Holy Spirit in them yet like we do, though. That changed everything. Amen. Changed it all. Because the love of God was shed abroad in their heart. And so, but it really shows what self-interest will do. It'll cause division. You know, one day I, I was preaching. I'm very sensitive to the atmospheres. Very sensitive as a pastor. One day I was preaching and, and, and um, I just felt off preaching. And I felt like there's something not quite right in the church. This was years ago. And uh, I just couldn't put my finger on it, but I knew it. And there wasn't nobody giving me frowny faces. Everybody was, you know, I just, nothing's showing me that, but I just knew it. And then later I found out that there was a, a, a sister in the church that was mad at another sister. And she was walking around red-faced, stomping around. I said, oh, okay, there we go. So you know what I did? Kicked her out of the church. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> we talked to her privately, Leslie and I. And we said, sister, it's not going to fly like that in here. You know, Tell us what's wrong. And then we, we, we tried to grow that sister in that there's better ways to handle things. Amen? We can all get in the flesh if we're not careful. But if we get in the flesh, there's souls in the balance. Souls in the balance. I won't even talk to someone unless I know 100% that I'm not going to do it in the flesh. I'll, I'll wait as long as it takes because I don't want to talk to someone out of the flesh. Because it's not my right to do that. Amen. I'm to be their shepherd. I'm to take care of them, not, not scold anybody. And, and so I'm very careful. I, I believe I've done a pretty decent job at that. I want to keep doing good at that too. <laughs> but those, those uh, James and uh, John, they had, some, they had some trouble, did they not? Look what they were up to in Luke chapter 9, verse 54. I got eight minutes. I'm right on time. Luke chapter 9, 54. 
Now, while you're turning there, James and John and Peter, what was special about those disciples? They were in the inner circle. What's it take to get in that inner circle? Paul and Timothy had an inner circle, like-mindedness, fervency. Although they were in the inner circle, but these guys, they, they didn't, they, they had needed a lot of work. I, I have some ideas what got them in that inner circle, but they were the two that, that went on the top of, they were the three, Peter, James, and John, that went on the top of, of Mount Trans, of Transfiguration and saw that, that vision up there, right? They were the three that went a little further in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus went in there to pray. They were the three that went in with Jesus when he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Could it be that they were fervent? They had desire, they had zeal, and, but it just wasn't tempered in love yet? Peter's the one that cut the guy's ear off that came to arrest Jesus. And I wanna let you in on a little secret here. He wasn't trying to cut the ear off. He missed. <laughs> Jesus picked the ear off, put it back on. But yet Peter went on to be one of the greatest selfless servants of God that ever walked the face of the planet. He himself became a martyr. But he, he wouldn't have grown like that if Jesus wouldn't have put the time in him. Amen. And then the Holy Spirit came. That was, that, like I said, the day of Pentecost changed everything. Because instead of God walking beside them, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was in them. And that's why Jesus said, it's better for you that I go because I'm sending you someone. I'm sending you another comforter, someone just like me. Who else can be just like God but God? God, the Holy Spirit. Guess what? He lives in you too. If you feel like cutting someone's ear off, God, the Holy Spirit will help you walk in peace. So this is when, when the village of Samaria wouldn't let Jesus spend the night. And uh, look at Luke 9, 54. It says that when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, listen to this now. You're not going to believe this if you haven't read this. Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Man, let me just stop there. They wanted to burn them all up. Men, women, children, dogs, cats, goldfish, they wanted just a big dark spot there on planet Earth that used to be Samaria. And we called the fire down and burned them all up because they wouldn't let Jesus spend the night. And so Jesus, in verse 55, and he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. You know what I think an issue of a lot of churches today? Those people sitting in those pews don't know what manner of spirit they are of. Do you know, no matter how rotten someone has treated you, they are not the enemy. You have one enemy, his name's Satan. They are the object of God's love, just like you are. If you make people your enemy, you're going you're gonna to struggle. You say, well, they get on my nerves. Well, you better pray for them. You say, well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, you know what? Stop talking about it and start praying for them. We can preach to ourselves, too, can't we, sometimes? And so, now James, you know, these James and John went on to be great ministers. James was the first, first disciple killed. John was the last to die. We know he went on the island of Patmos. Now, and, um, but if you read John's writing that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, 
it, later in his life, it shows that he still had a fervency of spirit, but it was, it was, it was tempered by love. John went from the son of thunder to the apostle of love. I see a lot of people in here. They, were, they went from anger and rage and, and self-centeredness to now they're apostles and, and children of love. There's a journey that we take. Amen? And sometimes messages like these from pastors are needed because it, we have to always be reminded of these, these fundamental truths. Because nothing else matters if we don't get everything I said tonight. If we don't get this in place, nothing matters. But this will make things matter and come real as we, as we continue to follow God's will for our life. And so we know Peter, he went on, Jesus went on to, and said to Peter, he said, Peter, if you love me, do what? Feed my sheep. The man that cut, cut another man's ear off, who missed. Jesus came back around and said, I, basically, I trust you that you do love me and you will, you will shepherd my sheep. You'll take care of my sheep. Whose sheep? Jesus' sheep. Amen? And so, um, in closing, I just want to say I was thankf thankful for my trip out at Rama. Um, those people are still on fire as they ever were. And um, uh, Charles Cowan spoke in the morning. He's a good faith teacher. And um, one thing that they do on camp meeting, they, they just they continually hit those fundamentals of faith. I know the, uh, the, the uh, Copeland said this. I think it was Gloria Copeland who said this, that when, when our ministry starts to struggle or Ken and I start to struggle, we'll go back and listen to Brother Hagen's um, sermons on faith, the fundamentals. Because somewhere we've let a fundamental slip. If you get out of the love walk, you, you, you got out of the, the will of God. That's sort of a big block that you need, <laughs> Right? You can't say, well, I've walked in love for 30 years. I'm good now. No, you got to walk in love until you hear come up hither. Because if you don't, you'll be like the people that the Bible says you hear the word and don't do the word, hear the word and don't do the word, and you deceive your own selves. And you're not building a house on, our, on the rock of the foundation of God's word. You're building it on sand. And uh, one of the things that, uh, one of my highlight was uh, when uh, Fred Price's son spoke. And uh, we know uh, Fred Price went home to be with the Lord here this, this last year, I believe it was. And I think he was, um, he might have been in his 90s. His wife is 88. And um, she got up there and spoke, and she, she, she loves Rama. They go back a long way together. And she said, I came into this world a poor black girl, and I'm leaving a rich black girl. See, she had her whole family there, all the daughters and everybody. And here is Fred Price Jr. He's not really a junior. He's actually the third. But he's, he's, he's speaking, and he's standing, like, right beside the Rama emblem. And he said, man, this is an honor where it all started. And you know what? He's a good preacher. He's a good teacher. He, he looks just like his dad. And he said... Um, um, his mother, who, like I said, who spoke, she was so funny. She said, you know, when I got pregnant with Fred, I was 44 years of age. And she said, and Fred wasn't happy, the dad. My husband wasn't happy <laughs> about it. And, uh, but back then he was mi traveling and ministering with um, uh, Brother Hagen, And Brother Hagen prophesied over him. And he said, look, your wife's pregnant with, with a son. And he's going to grow up, and he's going to bring you much joy, and he's going to carry on your ministry. Because, you know, Fred lost a son earlier. A son had died in a traffic accident or something. And, and, uh, but I guess, you know, what ministered to me, some of you might know, some years earlier, they, the, the Fred Price's ministry in Ramah, they were sort of at odds with each other. And... Um, got a little bit ugly for a while. 
But they squelched that. And Mrs. Price said, this is the 50th year anniversary. I told all my kids, we're coming, we're going. They filled up the whole row, the, his, her daughters and her husbands. And, and, the, and, and um, Pastor Hagin said, well, if you're coming, Fred might as well preach. Fred Jr. might as well preach. And it was a testament of people getting past hard feelings. People loving each other. I mean, she said, uh, Mrs. Price said that, uh, she said for years, we have personally, out of our account, we have, we have given $50,000 a year to Rama. They've done it for years. I was doing a funeral one time and I was with another minister. He must have knew that we were sort of like word of faith and and he, start, he starts in on Fred Price. And he's like, can you believe that guy has like 10 Rolls Royces? Like, well, I didn't know that. More power to him. And then I was talking to mom later. She says, I wonder if he knows that he, that he, he, he lives off of the 10% and gives the 90% to the church. And he still has 10 Rolls Royces. <laughs> Why can't Christians prosper? Why can't Christians write books and sell millions of books? Because that's probably what he did. Why can't Christians make good investments in the stock market that led by the Holy Spirit? That's what Brother Hagin did. You want to know how Brother Hagin became a millionaire? In the stock market. I heard him say it himself. That's one of the ways. God gave him wisdom. And he sold a lot of books too. <laughs> but that all goes back into the ministry. And so... But that was the highlight there. I just saw those two families come together and love each other and, and just be about the gospel. And Fred, Fred um, Jr., he, he, he got a little emotional and he said, you know, we miss my dad. He said we weren't ready for him to go. And he, he said his dad flatlined three times. And uh, he said, but once you flatline, you're, you're in glory. And once you get a glimpse of glory, Ain't nobody going to want to come back. They're going to be like, well, you're on your own. <laughs> I'm staying here. And then Pastor Hagin got up and um, talked about his dad when his dad left some years, some years ago, 2005, I think it was, and um, shared a, a special moment like that, too. And so, but I just want to, as far as Rama goes, they're, they're still celebrating. They're still preaching the word. And they're still on fire for God. And uh, so it's a good deal, right? All right. You can rise. We'll, we'll close in prayer here. So thank you for coming. And so let's pray and ask the Lord. Say, Lord, what must I do to excel at edifying in my church? I know that he's going to give you people to talk to. Now, you don't have to give them a Bible lesson or just give them encouragement. Amen? But start preparing your heart and getting a mindset that when we come in here, this is kingdom business. And we are, we are, we are here for one another. If you're, the Bible says if you're hurting, I'm hurting. If you're crying, I'm crying. If you're celebrating, I'm celebrating. We're connected. You want to know what's going to usher in the next great move of the Spirit? That. It's going to come out of the local churches. Just like ours. And we are prime, prime candidates to be really at the, at the spear of it all. Amen? Because we've got wonderful youth pastors and children's pastors and ministries. Amen? We've got 44 years of plowing some good ground, sowing some good seed. And so I, I promise you all along in these last days, we're not, you're not going to miss out on the moving of the Holy Spirit. You'll be right in the middle of it. Let's see what God's going to do with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this um, time that we had tonight. And I thank you, Lord, that we can um, celebrate you. And we can celebrate each other. And now, Lord, I pray that you, you keep each and every person safe. Keep them um, happy, Lord, and prosperous in all that they do. And watch over not only them, but watch over their, their children and their children's children, Lord God. And Father, I just thank you that 
um, will continue to get closer to you in every way, Lord, and line up with your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.